Uh, thanks for tuning into Emacs Conference in general, as well as my short talk. Uh, today I'll be talking about a little uh, personal project I put together um, actually over a year ago, but it recently came back uh, kind of into my into my area of interest as I recently started a new job where I have a little more freedom to choose the tools that I use. I have administrative rights on my laptop, which has become something of an exciting uh, <clears throat> privilege to have. And uh, so this, uh, this, this little application, um, well, I'll, 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 I'll skip that and just kind of jump right into my, into my thesis uh, for those of you that might be planning to duck out for the RMS uh, talk starting, starting in a little bit. So essentially my thesis here is really that uh, the Emacs tool chain um, can easily be combined with other skills and used in kind of the Unix uh, paradigm of, of having sort of different tools to do different steps. We might actually use the same tool to implement a couple steps, but with that paradigm, each step is a individual item that can be sort of dropped in and replaced. So um, over the course of the talk, hopefully I'll come back to that thesis, but I'll now jump back and start walking through uh, what is org VM. So this is a very simple proof of concept program. We'll just jump over to um, perhaps a prettier view of the source code for it. This is implemented, oops, uh, there's some croft, I think, in my local. All right, so uh, there's config block at the top and we'll be jumping back and forth between the, between the code and the documentation. So the first thing I want to point out is that this is written in Node.js, but I think you'll find it be pretty trivial to implement in any language. Um, certainly, you're you're more than welcome to to use this. I'd be happy to accept your patches or or feature requests and things like that. Um, of course, bug reports, but I'd also encourage others to roll their own. You might well come up with a with a different version of this that's even cooler, and we can learn from each other. Um, if you've heard one of my talks before, you probably recognize a common theme. I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of head first, uh, development as a way to get invested in both the tool chain and a culture. All right. So let's, let's come back to org VM. First of all, we'll start with, with the itch I was trying to scratch. I wanted to be able to quickly get, uh, a, a, to use a web browser to browse my org documents particularly handy when the documents are full of cross links to each other. That meant I wanted to automatically export, um, particularly to HTML, but it made sense for me to automatic to include uh, markdown PDF or whatever format I want, because many times I'm taking, you know, I'm going to look at that file and then pop it into an email or upload it somewhere. Um, and then finally, um, it should be, therefore, pretty easy to download the document rather than view it once once I'm done. So let's just uh, let's just run a quick demo. And you'll see I'm still a Windows user. Yeah, I'm working on it. Um, so, all right, let's uh, first thing that we're going to do is fire up the program. Actually, for simplicity. Let's just admit we live in a DOS world. And as you can see, there's not much to it to get the application running. So with that done, then I can run out to my local host. And we'll just start by plugging in the name of a uh, of an org file. Uh oh, right. So I've got a little org file that I prepared that just kind of provides a proof of concept to this. And you can see, as as imagined, we're automatically turning that org file. Let's just take a quick look at it.
And here's that, that file now. So you can see nothing up my sleeve. This is a very basic org file that I use for, for testing this program. Images work. We've got some nicely syntax highlighted uh, code blocks in a couple different languages. And uh, not, not really that much going on there. All right, let's come back to the documentation. I pretty well covered this, I think, but you'll need a relatively recent version of Emacs. I haven't taken any pains to make this backward compatible. Um, to be fair, I haven't tested it extensively. It may well work on Emacs 26 or, or older versions. I'm personally uh, running 27.1 and 28, as well as recent builds of 29. Um, there's some quick start instructions here, which I'm going to take as read. You probably saw the, the, the key element of this, which involves starting the program. Uh, you do, I uh, will call out, you'll, if you're trying to play with this yourself, don't forget to run the no, the npm install command, uh, to, that'll bring in express.js, which the JavaScript we're about to look at is built on. So let's just take a look at the usage patterns real quick. Um, to use to use this, we're simply giving the document name without the org extension um, in whatever uh, <clears throat> file path, or I'm sorry, whatever uh, whatever we've configured the server to run on. In this case, port three thousand. Um, I also want to call attention to the fact that nothing in this program protects you from damaging yourself. This isn't meant as a production capability. This is something that's used to publish your own note files and, and roll them up to yourself. I, that's something I'll definitely look at adding, but I want people to be careful of it uh, while this is kind of in an alpha state. So, um, the so the default response is html and we saw that here but we also can modify the response format we're currently supporting html markdown and pdf and that's really enough to to select a different format that's really nothing more than adding well <laughs> type okay not sure what's going on there. Okay, well, there goes my demo. Nothing uh, shows me for uh, doing my talk live. Um, but this, fortunately, this error message is a nice segue to the part of the talk that I'd really like to focus on, hopefully bringing me back to that thesis. So um, as we start to look at code, what we're looking for is really this Emacs Lisp that's getting generated here. And you'll notice that's the, that's the stuff I thought was important to produce as, uh, as diagnostics while the program's running as well. So spoiler, this, this Elisp is dynamically generated by the program. And that's really the core of the way um, OrgVM or my OrgVM works. So this should look pretty similar to the to the view of the code we had a moment ago. You can see I've got some some basic. This is all hard coded into the program. Nothing fancy going on here. Um, the debug is simply controlling that, that diagnostic output that we looked at. There's some other hopefully fairly self explanatory programs or uh, properties where to where to find Emacs and so forth. And then um, and then finally, we come in to the to kind of the meat of it, the the, the variables that are used to control what e what uh, e list we can generate dynamically. So here we're controlling the extension that it should look for org files. Hopefully, not too many people out there with a weird extension for the org files, but this this should support that. Um, I'm afraid that is something I've been known to do. Um, we have. Uh, then we define a list of additional export types. Uh, here's one that ought to work. Let's take a look at type equals org. And aha, uh -huh, 
it's giving us the file. So I'm not going to open that up, but now we can see that that's definitely working um, for certain versions of working. So one, so these, um, these, this, this list of type parameters is controlling the supported types. Hopefully, it should be fairly easy to add in different ones. The fancy footwork here involves, um, first of all, there's the extension and the mime type. That's as you might guess, used to control the response um, content type. Uh, we also have this replace variable. This prevents, there's an optimization to send an existing PDF or HTML file if that's already been generated, but only if the original source org file hasn't been modified since. Uh, this replace effectively can turn that off. If I remove the replace equals true attribute, then I'll... Uh, then I'll be prevented from overwriting that. In other words, I'll always send a cached version. That might be helpful if, uh, for example, you've got hand-tuned PDFs and you don't want to accidentally overwrite them. All right, let's get into the code a little bit more. Um, I'm going to skip past the really good stuff and jump into the boring parts so that we, we have them as context. Here's the default path, uh, and it, it is going to send me the README from the project um, or from the uh, project repo if I don't specify a path. Uh, and then we have a couple of different uh, endpoints that that we support. We'll come back to this first one. Uh, for now, let's start with the with the more normal one, which is just giving us a file name. So we can see we start by figuring out what the physical file name should be called. And assuming that that exists, um, oops, sorry, I've confused myself. Um, uh, so this is the, the caching or the optimization that I mentioned, sending the existing file. This uh, file exists is where the, the optimization is that uh, uh, that 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 regenerates the file if it, if the uh, source org document for the HTML generator has changed? Um, again, this is a short talk, so I'm not going to go into all the nuances of this JavaScript code. It's pretty far from an Emacs related thing. So, with that said, then the rest of this program is really mostly just handling. The different error. I didn't understand that type. I don't know the document. I failed. Otherwise, um, there's the caching. Um, and here, here's really where things get interesting, where we're call, where we've generated some elisp, and then we're calling Emacs with that elisp. If everything works, we'll send the file. If it doesn't, we'll send the five hundred. And uh, we've already seen the 500, so we know that works. All right, let's get to the interesting part. Um, sorry, <laughs> one more footnote. Um, there is a capability built in that will allow us to execute an org block. Let's see if that's working in our local. Remind myself how to do it. It's run, I think it's called test. And that's returning a 500. I'm suspecting that's run it because I'm running in command instead of bash. Oh yeah, so the failure is happening after I generate the e list, so I'm pretty confident that is what the actual problem is. If if we have uh, time, I'll jump back over there and relaunch it in uh, in uh, <clears throat> and get a bash, and we can we can see it actually work. But this works pretty well for me uh, on my work laptop. I didn't have to make any changes to it. So I have a fairly high amount of confidence, at least in trivial cases, this works pretty well. All right. So what I actually wanted to talk about today, um, and I'm going to be kind of hand-waving around this, this ES5 class that I've got and uh, kind of the way that works. It, hopefully this will be pretty familiar to you. Um, if you are a JavaScript programmer. The interesting stuff comes when we want to build some Lisp. Um, 
here you can see that uh, I am, I, I really don't have a whole lot of code around formatting Lisp. You can see that I've special cased whether the, I, I'm, uh, whether the arguments that were passed happen to be a function. If they are, I'm going to call that function. And then the result will be, uh, will be again formatted as Lisp. So this would be a recursive call here. Um, otherwise, um, I'm just going to return the arguments. Um, oh, I'm sorry. O otherwise, I will slap a pair of parentheses around uh, the result of, of locking that list. If I get uh, formatting each element of the list of arguments that this format list process calls uh, and separating them with spaces. So in short form, this program walks through a list. If the list it receives is a function, it calls that function. Once that's handled or, in, or otherwise, we simply walk the list, taking the arguments, concatenating them on strings, and finally wrap the results in parentheses. So what I didn't mention there, but might be obvious, is if I have a nested list, the inner list will be subjected to the same treatment. So this is a recursive sort of algorithm. All right. So now when I when I go to export, um, actually, in the interest of time, I'm going to avoid walking through that piece of code. And let's focus instead on the more interesting part of how that Lisp gets encoded. So coming back to the the PDF is a good example here because it's a it's got a special case. You can see I've specified this export fun or export function. That's that's a property none of these other types of types have. And you can see it contains some meat lisp telling us how to call the export for it. Let's go see how that's used. At the very end of what I just skipped over, the, the detailed how the org export process works, you'll see that I am ending with a step to call the export function. Here, I look to see whether I have an export function property. If I do, I call that function. And if I don't, I build this list with the default org export to file function using the file name and an output file name. So this hopefully is pretty familiar to anybody that's uh, that's manually messed around with calling org export to file. If it isn't, you can pretty well trust me for it. There's nothing very special going on. This looks rather like, yep, for example there, let's go back to our markdown. And there uh, we can okay. see. Uh, I'm going to make a Quick announcement. So can you hear me? Yes, go for it. Okay, uh, let me just uh, show my face. Oh, I'm not showing my face, damn it. Okay, uh, I'll make the announcement. You won't see my face quite yet. Uh, we are about to get started. Well, we actually just got started on dev with the talk by uh, RMS. So if you want to hop over to watch the talk by RMS, feel free to do so. Otherwise, we'll be continuing on Jen with Corwin to finish his talk and have a Q&A. Uh, Corwin, you can feel free to go now. Okay, bye everybody. <laughs> and for no. those sticking around, <laughs> um, I'm just going to kind of keep pressing on with this. In fact, I'm going to dive back into um, in into the part that I skipped here, um, which is the rest of how this how this export functionality works. So, um, just to make sure the dot is tied together, the the core of how this program works is generating some some elisp and then passing it to emacs in batch mode so if that wasn't perfectly clear that's really 
what's going on with this program. The rest of the implementation is just a way to do that or certain features that are supported when uh, in that generate in that generated ELISP, if you will. So this is, you could say, the minimum implementation I could come up with to create a web server for my local org documents. Um, and I will also uh, interrupt myself to just pull up the etherpad real quick. Um, actually, if somebody's listening and can share a link to that, I closed my browser window <laughs> with my with my links in it. Um, but uh, but sure, I'm ha I'm I'm happy to take questions at any point, Leo. If there are any questions for me, are you hanging out with me instead of watching RMS? You can go. <laughs> I'm teasing. No, I mean you know it's a people. We we know that some people can have both streams open. It's fine. Uh, and right now it's not the Q and A with RMS. It's just the presentation. So uh, feel free to get a little longer if you just want the live stuff. Go in. Do don't worry about it. You're fine. Yeah, and and uh, forgive me, everybody. If you were hoping for a quick, succinct talk, I happen to know I was going to be opposite RMS, so I awarded myself the the liberty of rambling. So, if you do have a question, something that I alluded to and haven't come back to yet, you should you should by all means prompt. Uh, Cohen, what I might do, I'm just giving you a little heads up. Uh, I might need to go help at some point of a dev. So uh, if I need to do so, I will let you know right now and uh, inside the BBB room, and you'll be on your own to manage the chat. And you can just uh, talk backstage to us to manage what we do with the stream. Okay? Yep, that should be no problem at all. I've got my pad up now. Thank you, Scheisler. And I'm sorry about butchering your name there. And yep, I've, I've got uh, I've got my chat open and i think i'm pretty well set to self-manage oh i don't have a camera on so you can't see me giving you the thumbs up okay good all right so let's just walk through because it's sort of a sort of interesting code let's just take a look real quick at how we generated our our elisp here because it is there we go it is a little bit interesting so here's the method um, so I didn't get into detail on this, but there's an ES5 class that represents an org mode document. It has the static debug property that, as you might imagine, can be overridden by that debug setting we looked at in the defaults. Um, we also have a static variable that, that uh, a static uh, property that uh, gets that does nothing more than getting the path to Emacs out of those defaults. Similarly, we have a class method to um, uh, to, to, to spawn out an Emacs, as I mentioned, in batch mode, evaling some arbitrary list that's passed in. All right. So the type this this is where things start to get interesting. So this this is an implementation detail, um, but. Uh, that it's written as a static method, but essentially what's going on here is looking up from that type list to try to find a type that's passed in, and that's returning uh, one of these blocks. Let's say I've requested HTML, which would be the default, then I'm going to get this, this set of properties back. All right. Essentially, this program generates a uh, a, a program or, or a little uh, a little block of executable ELISP. However, in some cases, where if a custom if the load path has been customized in that uh, type block, uh, or um, I think that's the only case I supported. There was another complexity I removed. <laughs> Um, so in that case, then I can simply replace that program with a let. The, um, in e e either way, I'm going to have everything I generate be encapsulated in a single block. The, uh, then I'm calling that format list process that we talked about. 
appending to the or, or inserting into you could say um the uh the outer scope and we start by finding the file we then uh we then load any libraries that might be needed in some cases the type might not have any external libraries so we just so that's a no op and then finally um we're going to we're going to execute that logic I mentioned before about selecting either the default org export to file or else whatever elisp we 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 we've staged for exporting that particular file type. And again, in the case of PDF, there's a special uh, function that's used to to trigger that export. You may be aware that that's that's a little more complicated. There's intermediate forms there. <clears throat> All right. So um, just reminding myself if there's anything else I have to cover as back on background. And I think that that pretty well covers the basics. All right, let's look at that source block execute. This is the other use of the format list function. So here, rather than looking up a type and passing in, um, passing that through our, our org export method, and then that type is used to get the 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 lisp that we want to create in the case of source block execute um we're kind of rolling it a lot more by hand so this gives us a good chance to sort of unwind how that lisp looks when it's staged as javascript data so here again i wrap everything in a progin i start uh, by preventing an interactive prompt uh, for the Babel execution. And then um, then we load languages. This relates to another piece of our um, of our configuration where we've specified uh, a set of languages that it's okay to execute. So if that type isn't isn't in this list, then 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 we won't be able to to execute it in line through our our little web trivial little web server all right with with that done then loading the selected language we then once again open the file and we'll whoops let bind a uh, a return value which is uh, calculated by using org source block execute on the name of the block that's given. And then uh, we use a temp, uh, a temp buffer to, uh, to write that out to a temporary file. This is actually a little clumsy, but I haven't put the effort in to have this written out to the standard output cleanly uh, instead of using a temp file. So under, this is another example of where it may not be production, well, it definitely is not production worthy code in that uh, under heavy load, this, this would certainly break with collisions on the Babel file, uh, the name of the Babel file. In any case, once we've staged up our ELISP, which is, this is basically variable interpolation, um, then we, uh, we just call Emacs on that. And if we look down to where that's called, you can see that the org byte Babel file name calculated here uh oh is that a problem? No, I'm fine. I'm just lost in my code. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh, oh means, oh, I need to, to intervene. What is going on? <laughs> Carry on, please. <laughs> no, I'm fine, Leo. Thank you. All right. So then, so you can see we get, we, uh, we send the Babel file here, which is uh, calculated manually. A bit sloppy there since I have essentially the same. I have two different places where I'm calculating the org doc file in two different ways. 
Uh, have I encouraged you to write your own badges or send badges? All right. So that's that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of this program. Let's go back to just seeing if we can uh, make it run. Hmm. All right, well, I apologize for not having taken the time to stage my demo this morning. Better for you. Um, but apparently it's going to be non-trivial to make the, uh, to make the program work. Let's just, before I completely give up, let's go ahead and try our task, our Babel execute, and that too is failing. So there's something unhappy in my local world. Must be time to get rid of Windows. Um, but in any case, let's go ahead and just take a look at that. Uh, let's see. Is it control insert? Yes. Let's take a look at that generated ELSP and compare it to, whoa, and compare it to, um, said. I'm just going to format this manually because I've forgotten my key bindings to auto format it. There we go. All right. So now we can see, as as promised, there's really nothing going on here other than the interpolation of the variables in. We're inserting. Uh, we're using an insert and write file method, which is again rather sloppy, to uh, to generate the text file. All right, let's come back to our documentation and see if we can we can sort of put a bow on the project. So I hope I've convinced you that this was actually rather easy to do. The entirety of my index.js file is. Uh, 262 lines, and that includes a good 40 of uh, white space and and configuration. It has only one dependency, the Express, which really builds the web server. Any language you'd rather implement this in has uh, will have a similar capability for building some type of trivial web server. And I think you may find I certainly found that. A large portion of the code base is really making the errors uh, meaningful. In that, you know, in some cases, sending an appropriate HTTP status based on what happened. In other cases, um, let's see if I've got an explicit throw left in here. In other cases, just just trapping different types of failure conditions. I'm going to look at my pad, and I do see a question here, so let me jump in here. Uh, Colin, just to make sure, are you switching to Q&A? Are you finished with your presentation? Well, as I said, I'm happy to take Q&A throughout, but yes, let's say yes to that. Okay, so Colin, what I'm going to need to do now, uh, you are in charge of the room. We are going to open up the, the room so that if people have questions watching right now on Jen, feel free to come in. and. Uh, there was something else I needed to say. Uh, yes, going. If there's any problem, uh, whisper to us on Mumble. So you might want to unmute Mumble and be able to listen to us over there. I I can't do I can't do that, Leo. I, if I unmute oh, Mumble, it's going to bleed through. Uh, okay, sure. Well, if you have any problem, uh, type in emacsconf org the channel, and we'll be with you. Okay. Yeah, or I'll PM somebody. But I I don't anticipate having any problems. I'll put something in org when I run out of steam here. How's that? 
Amazing, cool. So I, I will have to leave the room though. I'm leaving the recording going so that we have your Q&A. Uh, and whenever okay. you're available- I'll, shut, the, off the, the button. I'll shut off the recording when I close the room. Okay, great. Good luck, Owen. Thank you. All right, and if you're still with me, um, well, thanks. Uh, I'm, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I did uh, offer to the opposite RMS, and I'm in no way offended if people do want to jump over, especially as that starts to shift over to q and I'm taking Leo's leave, leaving as a pretty good indication that that's, that's happening now-ish. So no, uh, <laughs> totally understand if, if folks are more excited to do that. Meanwhile, let me just jump over to the question that I received. I'll show the, uh, I'll show the pad here so that uh, save myself reading the question out, but I'll paraphrase it. Why am I not running the web server in Emacs? That would be a great way to do it. I chose to build it in Node.js because that was trivially easy for me. Um, and then finally, am I using org info JS? No, I learned about this essentially at this conference. So I'll be look that's something I'd like I'll be learning more about and it could well influence this project. All right, and thanks for the questions. All right, I'm gonna slow my roll just a little bit here because I think I kind of have all the time in the world. Um, I will be wrapping up within about 15 or 20 minutes at the latest, just uh, to avoid stressing out uh, my fellow organizers, especially Leo and Sasha that have the bulk of the heavy li lifting this year. And uh, Amen, and and really thanks, thanks all to everybody. God, the nice, nicest part of doing the, my own talk is that I get to say that um, this is just so much fun to contribute to EmacsConf. And um, if you're at all interested, there's plenty of of completely backstage behind the curtain role, behind the curtain roles. It doesn't mean you have to be somebody that likes talking or being on webcam. Sorry that my camera isn't working this year. I spent quite a while fussing with that and lost all my time to get my prereq working. Um, all right. So, trying to think where I can take us without my demo working. I was really hoping to show the org Babel piece. That's really fun. So let me just mention briefly some um, how I'm using this at work. So at work, I'll have um, some type of org document and usually it's a project. So, I use, um, so the title of the document is my project and then I'll have um, a requirements section and I'll have a uh, meeting notes section. That's probably the key thing. And then as the project goes on, I'll start having, uh, I'm a solutions architect. So my job is formalizing design in large part. So then I'll have a design documents section that, and this, and this is where I'll be doing a lot of my work. So I'll start out saying, And maybe Bob is a subject matter expert whose buy-in I need to have on how we're going to do the do the high-level design. Maybe a lead engineer, or a dev manager, something like that. All right. As my work goes on, then this will start getting into uh, more detail.
and things of this nature. As things get further and further, I'll actually have documentation that I'm adding in here. Uh, oh, I see. It's a big mess. All right. Well, we'll just reuse this. So I can insert those all in line. And now for the fun part, let's see if the tr the most trivial case is working here. No. All right. Completely broken. Let me drag. All right. Well, apologies again for uh, the poor quality of my demo today. And let me just look real quick at my etherpad once more. And I'll glance at BBB to see if there's anybody jumping in with questions. And then I'll go back to IRC and, uh, and look for questions there. Okay, and I don't see any additional questions on the pad. I'm just going to scan IRC real quick. Um, I suspect that the tree sitter comment isn't for me. All right, and I'm not seeing a lot of questions there. Um, so um, I'm just going to vamp for just a minute or two. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a, con a, a conference volunteer. This is my third year volunteering with the conference. Um, and probably if you take one thing away from my talk, it should be, I really like volunteering for the conference. It's fun. Um, it makes me feel sort of close to the pulse, uh, and it gives me a chance to just interact with people that have very different perspectives on Emacs, which is something that I, I really value a lot. Emacs, like anything else, um, you know, sort of in the internet world, uh, has a real echo chamber, chamber factor. If you do or don't like use package, you probably interact with a lot of people that feel the same way about, about that. Um, and so, I, I really recommend volunteering for EmacsConf as a way to sort of mix it up and 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 get to know people that that may not use Emacs the same way that you do. Um, or perhaps more on topic, though the log line for this talk is it's really quite easy to you to build a program that that uses Emacs and a pipeline capability. And I think there's a ton of opportunity in this space. This particular example is just a trivial web server written uh, written using Node.js. But as was pointed out, we could have used uh, we could used L Node as a as a web server and done the entire thing within Emacs Lisp, um, or or really almost any technology would would get us um, this capability. From an implementation standpoint, I had a lot of fun building this, this trivial little ELISP parser. And I'm rather pleased with the, the fact that the entirety of that, of the entire the entire algorithm for turn it for, for turning JavaScript or uh, JSON data, if we could say, into ELISP is really a, a one-liner, albeit a nasty one-liner. Um, that was that was pretty cool to discover how simple that was. So in my mind, that opens up a lot of possibility. If it's this easy in JavaScript, I wouldn't expect it to be hard any more difficult in your favorite language. Glance one more time to see if there happen to be any other questions. And not seeing any, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, start wrapping up my chat now. Uh, it will take me a couple minutes to do that. So if you're if you do have any other questions that you want to drop into the pad or any comments, you're more than welcome to uh, hit me with those as I coordinate closing this chat this talk uh, with with the with the organizer team. 